uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the participants uh, of this ongoing uh, project with uh, it's already 11th year, I think. Uh, yes. It's already 11th year, so it's a remarkable accomplishment, in my opinion. And the topic is, of course, very interesting and <coughs> very challenging. First of all, I think that uh, we should define <coughs> how we understand the liberal. Uh, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the participants uh, of this many ongoing uh, project of what it means and uh, how we should approach it. I personally have my own explanation. I think that liberal world order implies that uh, this uh, order uh, is uh, uh, based on certain rules, uh, that uh, this order is uh, inclusive rather than exclusive, and uh, that this order is rational rather than non-rational. But uh, I think that uh, any of you can come up with a different suggestion on how to define Second, I think uh, in the uh, framework of this debate, it's important to ask ourselves a question, to what extent the liberal world order uh, is uh, uh, linked uh, uh, to the U.S. hegemony. And uh, is uh, hegemony uh, a kind of indispensable characteristics of this order, or rather this order can exist uh, 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 without hegemony? And likewise, I think a big question is whether uh, we uh, can and we should connect the liberal world order with political liberalism, or we should rather regard it as a more technical set of rules, uh, like, I don't know, a multiplier table, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, no political meaning, but has mostly technical norms and rules of the game that can be used by both liberal and uh, illiberal uh, 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 countries and regimes. Uh, finally, uh, speaking of China, of course, uh, a big question is uh, uh, if uh, the liberal world order served China so well and uh, China was able to become what it is right now in the framework of this liberal order, why should China challenge uh, this liberal order? Why should uh, China uh, 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 oppose this order. Of course, uh, you know, if we follow the China rhetoric, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, the famous speech of Chairman Xi at the World Economic Forum, he argued that China is uh, the main defender of the liberal world order, of free trade, uh, of uh, access to international markets against uh, those uh, who would like to encroach upon the rules uh, of the liberal world order. Of course, there is a bit of hypocrisy here, but nevertheless, I think that uh, it's an important question. And finally, uh, the question which I think uh, should be also considered in the context of this discussion, uh, if we assume that uh, the liberal world order uh, is under challenge, then what can possibly replace the liberal world order? Is there any other alternative order or uh, it's the only order we can count on, and the only alternative uh, is a global disorder with all the negative implications of this disorder. So these are the questions which I consider to be important. I don't want to take more of your time, uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, participants to this uh, round of debates will have uh, uh, an inspiring uh, and uh, a productive uh, conversation. Uh, this morning in the United States and this evening in Moscow. Thank you. Dixie? Me? Oh, okay. Well, I just want to thank uh, our partners, uh, the REAC and, of course, the Fletcher School and the Tufts University in general. Thank you very much for supporting this project. And I would like to thank all the speakers who uh, participate today in our discussion. I'm not going to take uh, too much time, just uh, a few uh, words of uh, thanks to our partners, to Arik, to Ivan for supporting this project. I guess this is a very important thing. We started, yes, more than 10 years ago as a student initiative, and now <laughs> you see we uh, we uh, really hope for the, for the next uh, decade for our po project, and uh, I guess that uh, it will be something new. 
Uh, in December, we have uh, traditional debates uh, among Russian participants, and this is the second year when we have uh, international debates uh, among international uh, speakers. So I hope not the last, but just the second time and many, many times ahead. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Arik, yes, the yeah. moderator of our session. We have very strict rules, and he will explain that these rules. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Fletcher School, uh, I would like to express uh, our uh, pleasure in collaborating with both REAC and Creative Diplomacy. This is the second time we have worked together to organize uh, the Kortunov Global Affairs uh, debates, and we very much look forward to this series of three uh, debates. Uh, so I would like to welcome everyone to the first uh, of three rounds of the 2021 uh, debates. Uh, the question at hand today is, does the rise of China threaten the liberal international order? Uh, our speakers include Michael Beckley, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at Tufts University, uh, Duncan Freeman, a research fellow at the EU China Research Center at the College of Europe, uh, Anatole Lieben, professor uh, at Georgetown University and visiting professor at King's College London. And finally, Alexander Lukin, professor and department head of the School of International Affairs at uh, the National Research University Higher School of Economics. Uh, I will go over uh, the rules of the debate and then uh, we will begin. So. Uh, two teams, each consisting of two speakers, will debate uh, one question during a period of roughly an hour and a half. Uh, we will start uh, the debate with uh, voting uh, by the audience, uh, yes or no on the question. Then we will have a round of opening remarks, uh, five minutes each uh, from the debaters. Uh, there will be a round of rebuttals, four minutes each. Uh, then we will have opportunities for the speakers to pose questions uh, to each other. Uh, one minute for the question and two minutes for the answer. Uh, finally, we will have comments and questions from the audience. A final word from each speaker, two minutes, and uh, the audience will get to vote again uh, to determine which side of the debate was more persuasive. So without further ado, uh, we will go ahead and start the poll. Uh, so the question is, does the rise of China threaten the liberal international order? Yes, no, or undecided? It looks like the voting has stopped. So we have 27 responses total, 52% uh, say yes, 37% say no, and 11% are undecided. Okay, we will go ahead and uh, begin. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Michael Beckley. All right, well, thank you so much for putting this together. It's a really wonderful event. Um, since this is a debate, I'm gonna dispense with any nuance or context and just unload a lot of favorable arguments to uh, our side of the debate. Um, I, I think it's, it's not too hard to make the case that China is engaged in a full frontal assault on the liberal order. If you think about what really underpins the liberal order, it's an open global economy, it's the spread of democracy and uh, a set of international institutions. And China, I think, in many ways, threatens all of those things. It's also threatening to start 
some major wars, which I'll get back to maybe later on in the debate. But for now, I just want to focus on these three pillars and how China is challenging them. I think from an economic perspective, China is threatening to take us from a liberal trading order to much more of an illiberal empire. Uh, China has been essentially a Trojan horse for the World Trade Organization. It got in and then proceeded to erect a ton of non-tariff barriers, things like hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies to state-owned enterprises, random regulations that make it so foreign companies aren't even allowed in China's market, let alone can't compete with Chinese companies. And there's no way for the WTO to prosecute these, even in cases of successful litigation. That litigation has taken so long that China already dominates the industry in question. So, you know, whether it's solar power or what have you. Um, so clearly, China has undermined the central institution that runs the global economy. And at the same time, it's engaged in rampant economic espionage. No country has stolen more technological secrets. Just from the United States alone, China has pilfered hundreds of billions of dollars every single year over the last couple of decades. Loan sharking, uh, China has extended more debt to developing countries than the World Bank, the IMF, or the Paris Club, which is like the 22 largest rich country lenders in the world. All of those governments combined don't extend as much debt to developing countries as China does. So now these countries are in the hawk to Beijing, and they basically have to tow the party line on any range of issues. And so China is using that leverage to carve out an exclusive economic zone where these developing countries have to use Chinese technology. They have to adopt Chinese telecommunications uh, networks and, and, of course, uh, just abide by whatever Beijing wants them to say. And China has weaponized all of these economic tools multiple times, not just on issues of vital security, but for really any slight any setback is met with a wolf warrior meltdown of just economic coercion. So Australia got hit with basically a full blown trade war with Beijing for the audacity of suggesting, hey, let's we should probably figure out where COVID came from. Uh, Norway uh, had its salmon exports uh, decimated because of the Nobel Prize Committee awarded a Chinese dissident the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, South Korea trying to protect itself from North Korea with a missile defense system. China wages a trade war. So clearly, this is not the open liberal trading order that uh, the founders of this system envisioned. Uh, the second argument is I think China is clearly trying to reverse the spread of democracy abroad. Uh, Beijing has spent billions of dollars every year on an anti-democratic toolkit of NGOs, media companies, hackers, bribes, all designed to prop up autocrats and so chaos in democracies. And guess what? It's actually working quite effectively. Authoritarianism has been spreading and democracy receding every single year since 2006. And China is one of the main drivers of this democratic recession. I mean, you can you can pick a dictator anywhere and chances are Beijing is, is supporting him. Um, and it's about to get worse because uh, China is pioneering uh, this digital authoritarian system that just makes dictatorships so much more efficient and effective than it ever used to be because it basically harnesses the data collection and uh, messaging power of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and just concentrates it in the hands of a dictator. And so instead of having to rely on uh, expensive death squads to beat populations into submission, now autocrats can send subliminal messages through social media feeds and monitor their entire populations with millions of cameras and use facial and speech recognition technology. And so China has been pioneering this, and it's, not, it's created this system that has not only made Orwellian social control affordable, it's actually made it profitable because the same, what Beijing calls smart city technologies, not only can be used to hunt down dissidents, but can also help, you know, the trains run on time and help enhance infrastructure. And so every tyrant on the planet has said that they want China's system. And China is already selling and operating these digital authoritarian systems in more than 80 countries. And this isn't just undermining democracy, it's enabling atrocities. If you want a preview of what this future world looks like, just look at Xinjiang, where smart city technologies exist side by side with concentration camps. And when Uyghurs have tried to flee from Xinjiang, China's authoritarian allies have used Chinese surveillance technology to track them down and then extradite them back to Beijing. This is a huge threat to liberal democracy. Uh, the third pillar that China's undermining, international institutions. China's hollowing out all of the major international institutions that make up the liberal order. I already said that the WTO is essentially a dead letter because you can't prosecute all of these non-tariff barriers that China has erected. The UN Security Council is often hamstrung because of China. Other councils within the UN uh, are stacked with China's authoritarian allies. The UN Human Rights Commission is essentially a joke. It's signed off on uh, what's going on in, in Xinjiang at China's behest. The World Bank and the IMF can't compete 
with Chinese loans. So they've essentially given corrupt regimes around the world a permanent line of credit. Even the World Health Organization, which should be the least political organization given its humanitarian mission, has been corrupted by Chinese influence. When you know, China unleashes COVID, then tries to cover it up, the WHO not only fails to expose the problem, but it starts parroting Chinese misinformation. Taiwan, which tried to give us all early warning about it, was excluded from the organization. Um, and, and, and then the subsequent investigation that WHO ran gave China a free pass. And so now we're probably never going to know where or how the plague of the century emerged. Um, so I, I assume my five minutes are basically up. I could literally go on for five hours about all the ways that China challenges, threatens the liberal order. Um, I'll talk more about military stuff maybe later Thank on. You, Thank you, Professor Sackley. Uh, now uh, we will move on to um, Duncan Freeman, a uh, research fellow at the EU China Research Center at the College of Europe. Sorry, thanks. Um, one thing maybe that needs to be corrected, um, if this is going to be online, is that I'm not actually a research fellow at the um, at the College of Europe anymore. So um, I just make a note of that at the beginning of my five minutes. Um, but um, maybe it can be corrected later. Um, so yeah, is China the, the uh, a threat to the the global liberal order? Um, well, of course, it really depends on what you mean by the global liberal order, which is very much debated. But I think ultimately, whether you consider it to be something which is real um, and um, a constituent part of international relations, or whether you regard it simply as a, an ideological fig leaf for American imperialism, it is quite clear, however you interpret um, the, the global liberal order that China does effectively undermine the, um, the, the, the order simply largely by its very existence and by the success of its um, either political or economic model. Um, the rise of China, which doesn't really encapsulate, encapsulate exactly what has been happening in China and in East Asia for the last, um, well, 40 years um, has fundamentally changed, not just the relationship between um, major economic powers, but the structure of the economic um, relationships in, in particular, and consequently, or consequently also the political and the military and other um, aspects of the global system. Um, the system which was basically created after World War II and, um, and based on uh, U.S., hegemony, um, the primacy of e uh, U.S. power, but which was never even at the height of U.S. power, a global system. It's always been a partial system in terms of its geographic reach, in terms of its, um, if we consider its political liberalism or its economic liberalism, it's never actually been a, a, a global um, universal system. Um, especially in East Asia in the, the period after the Second World War. Um, the uh, global um, uh, liberal order has always been extremely weak and, and in fact, even marginal. Um, after 1949, um, the, f the establishment of the, of the People's Republic of China was only one um, central part of the failure of US power in East Asia, but the system which existed in, the, in East Asia, even after 1949, was basically um, founded on illiberal economics um, and authoritarian political systems. Um, and this has been the fundamental um, reason for the success 
of East Asia um, in the period after 1949. The rise of China has merely accentuated um, the fact that this liberal order has never been very central to East Asia. And the consequences of the rise of China um, have not just been seen in East Asia, but have now become global. Um, the challenge is to both the democratic liberalism, the political liberalism of the global order, which has been espoused um, by the Western powers, um, and particularly to the economic liberalism of, um, uh, the, of the, the liberal order. Um, China, ever since it began its process of opening and reform, has never um, accepted the, um, the neoliberal Washington consensus, much of the Western world persuaded itself, particularly after 1989, that China had come to accept this consensus, but this has never, ever been the case. Um, and today, the success, the economic power of China means that, that, that now in the United States, um, and in Europe, we are copying China. We are, we are basically, what we have now in, in Europe is an increasing focus on um, industrial policy protectionism. In the United States, the commitment to liberal economics was always somewhat tenuous. Um, and in response to China is now increasingly um, being rejected. And so by response and by its own um, very fact of its, um, its rise, China has come to threaten the global liberal order. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. And we will make sure to correct uh, your title uh, on the event announcement. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, our next debater is uh, Professor Alexander Lukin. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, mm, I listened to the two yes speakers with great interest, but I'm in the no, no team, so I have to say no. Uh, also, it would, will not be a simple no, uh, because, you know, there are some questions that you cannot just answer simply, simply yes or no. Uh, I remember there was a very nice uh, children's book by Astrid Lindgren, uh, a Swedish author, very famous in Russia. And one of the heroes gave a very good example. Have you, have, the question was, have you stopped drinking cognac in the morning? You cannot answer yes or no if you don't drink cognac at all, for example, or if you don't drink in the morning. Uh, or, or, so, so, you know, this, this question that was put to us is a bit similar because you cannot uh, undermine or threaten something that does not exist. And uh, in my view, uh, the so-called liberal order does not actually exist in practice. Uh, this is a, a, a Western myth or a utopian idea, utopian international order, which should be uh, created, but has not been created and will never be created uh, because it's impossible. Very similar to communism. You know, I lived in a communist country half of my life, and I remember very well how we were talking, and there was even a topic in uh, my university, uh, which I studied uh, scientific com communism, and there was nothing, of course, scientific about it. And, uh, well, you could ask a question at that time, uh, does uh, the United States, for example, or NATO undermine communism? Well, in a way, yes, you can say that. 
but taking into consideration that it does not exist, it has never existed and will and it will not exist. What actually existed uh, and uh, still exists now also in its, uh, I would say, final or very late stage is uh, the real uh, system of international relations or international system which has nothing to, nothing to do with liberalism or liberal international order. It's an order that was created after the Second World War uh, as a compromise uh, between the five uh, winners of the war. And, uh, uh, and it was based on the principle of sovereignty of nations. Uh, on the char on the UN Charter and on the power of the Security Council, this real uh, order, international order, uh, is undermined by the West, not by China or any other country, because uh, the West, by the West, I mean uh, by West, I mean um, the United, well, political West, uh, the United States and its uh, allies or settlers, and. Uh, uh, of course, because after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the collapse of the uh, bilateral uh, bi uh, bipolar world, or bipolar world system, there was a unipolar moment when uh, the West believed that it can actually create the liberal world order. This was the time of the end of, kist of history and uh, similar weird ideas, but it overestimated, uh, seriously overestimated its uh, strength. And now the world is moving, it's, I would say, continued moving into multipolar direction. The growth of China is, uh, the, uh, is uh, one of the main facts, I would say, or realities of this uh, uh, growing multipolar world. And we'll have to somehow live in this world. You can say all kinds of bad words as some people did uh, before. Some speakers today also said you can criticize China. Some, sometimes uh, you do it, uh, uh, you know, which is based on facts. Sometimes it's not, but uh, we have to think what to do with it. You cannot change such a huge country we're just, uh, you know, bullying it or applying sanctions. So my answer to this question is no, China's growth does not uh, undermine uh, the, uh, the liberal world order because the liberal world order does not actually exist. And what we should discuss is not this question, but the question was what, how to live together and coexist in the real multipolar world. Uh, I don't know if I used my five minutes. Uh, that's five minutes. Thank you so much, Professor Lukin. Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Professor Anatole uh, Lieben. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid, though, I have to also begin with a, with a correction uh, to my present job. I am, in fact, now a senior fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft uh, in Washington. Um, so perhaps you can also uh, correct, um, correct that on my, on my bio. Um, I just left Georgetown in the, in the summer. Uh, so, yes, um, I have to echo what um, my distinguished colleague Ambassador Lukin said, it reminds me, the, the liberal international order reminds me something um, that Mahatma Gandhi once said when he was asked about Western civilization. He replied, it would be a nice idea. Uh, a genuine liberal international order, a rules-based order, as it's called, would indeed be a nice idea, but that is not what the United States means by it. And um, I, I have to express my gratitude on that score to uh, Professor Beckley for some wonderful, I mean, wonderful, wonderful jokes. Um, China has weaponized economic tools. I mean, which country has imposed sanction after sanction on country after country over the past two generations without any international backing or legitimacy for this whatsoever? Uh, pick a dictator. Which country has supported most dictators around the world? Which country supports Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, Morocco? Which country has always supported a dictator which has served American interests? The United States. Uh, 
when it comes to the United the United Nations Security Council, I mean, please, <laughs> which country has uh, invaded? Uh, militarily, uh, repeatedly countries against the wishes, against the veto of the United Nations Security Council uh, and against a majority vote in the UN General Assembly. Uh, loan sharking? I mean, do, really, do, do you think that Western banks that have operated in Africa, in Latin America, uh, in Asia, all these years are charitable institutions and have behaved that way? I mean, wh who has brought about the greatest indebtedness by the developing world over the past three generations? Not China. So, I mean, the point is that uh, what America and its closest allies mean by a liberal order is two things. Uh, the first is, it is simply an order dominated by the United States and those countries which, for whatever reason, accept American leadership. But the second thing is, um, as has been stated, that uh, actually stated by Dr. Freeman, um, that what is today meant by the liberal order is very different in economic terms from what would have been meant by this two generations ago. It is, in fact, the neoliberal order of the Washington Consensus. But uh, that was never fully accepted by Europe, and as Dr. Freeman said, is now is now being rejected by Europe. Not, I would say, because of the Chinese model, uh, but because of older European and indeed American models of a much more state-governed and state-influenced version of capitalism. As for East Asia, it has never been fully developed, uh, fully accepted. And indeed, the Chinese economic model today is in certain respects very close to the state-led capitalism of Japan, Taiwan and South Korea, uh, especially, of course, during their periods of economic growth, uh, initial economic growth, uh, in Japan's case from the 1860s on, in the other cases from the 1950s on. Uh, but they were always considered part of uh, the capitalist world order, but they had their own capitalist but different economic model for this. So uh, China is a threat to the uh, neoliberal Washington consensus economic order, but not to the capitalist order. In fact, America's complaints about China in that regard really come down to the fact simply that today China is better at it. China exports more, China makes more, and above all, of course, China saves more and invests it in infrastructure and not in consumerism and debt, or at least certainly not in debt and not in consumerism to the same extent. So, I mean, we're talking here about uh, a combination of a, um, well, uh, yeah, let's call it a lie, frankly, um, you know, Amer what is actually American hegemony, not a liberal order. And, so, and insofar as it is a liberal order, it's a neoliberal neo order, not a traditional capitalist order. Now, when it there was a fascinating article, which I would urge you all to read by Peter Beinart in the New York Times a few weeks ago, in which he asks why uh, America and its closest allies now talk all the time about a rules-based order and not about international law, as they would have in the past. Well, once again, the answer is very clear, because America has violated international law over and over again. Uh, and in other cases, of course, um, has in a sense only not violated international law because it's never signed or ratified the treaties in the first place. Neither the Kyoto Protocol, nor the International Law of the Sea, nor the International Criminal Court, nor the International Landmines Convention. And in certain cases where it did sign them, the Paris Agreement, uh, the uh, nuclear treaty with Iran, it pulled out of them again uh, under Trump. Biden has returned to the uh, nuclear, is trying to return to the nuclear agreement with Iran, but in the process, uh, trying to renegotiate it against the terms of the original agreement and against the will of every other single member of the United Nations Security Council, by the way, as well as the United Nations General Assembly. So, I mean, in that sense, what rules-based order? Now, China, by contrast, um, two things. The first is, uh, that the idea that China is deliberately trying to spread authoritarian rule is totally false. There is not a single case in the world where China has actually tried to replace an existing democratic government with an authoritarian government. Uh, 
Frankly, it doesn't look to me as if China gives a damn what kind of government a country has, as long, of course, as it is favorable to China. Totally different, once again, from repeated US interventions to get rid of governments. When it comes to the issue of international law uh, and territorial issues involving China, there is only one case, as I say, compared to literally dozens, I would say, with the United States, where China can be shown clearly to have violated international law, and that is the Spratly Islands. In every other territorial dispute, the case is open under international law. And in one case, the Senkakos or Diaus, China's claims were previously endorsed by the United States itself. So, no, the answer is China is not a threat to a liberal order properly defined. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Liepen. Uh And uh, you did go uh, a couple minutes over, so if it's all right with you, I might uh, deduct that time from your rebuttal just so we have enough time for discussion with the audience. Uh, I will now turn it over to Professor Beckley for a rebuttal. I have to say I'm a bit confused. I didn't realize that the United States was on the resolution here. I thought we were here to talk about China. I, I frankly don't understand the relevance of much of what my two esteemed competitors have just talked about. I think you can fully, you can believe that the United States is a major threat to the liberal order and, and still believe that China is also a threat. And so I think we need to refocus the conversation on things that China is doing, unless we want to turn this into a debate about the United States versus China, which I'm happy to do, but that wasn't the resolution. Um, I want to talk about one other thing we haven't discussed yet, which is uh, security. Uh, I think in order to have any kind of order, a liberal order, any kind of international order, you obviously have to have some kind of bedrock of security. Um, and in particular, if you want some type of open liberal system, you can't have open trade if you know the sea lanes are militarized and big countries are preying on small ones. You, democracy is not going to thrive if countries are gearing up for war and international institutions can't rule if uh, if, if there's not solid military backing, we learned all this, you know, in, in World War II. And I think it's important to know that China is engaged in some pretty aggressive military buildup as well as expansion. And it has clear announced revanchist ambitions. And so there are multiple areas where a Chinese war looks much more likely than it did in the past. And this just by itself constitutes a threat to the liberal order. Uh, you can look at the border with India, where Chinese and Indian soldiers literally beat each other to death uh, a year ago. Now both armies are massing on that shared border. In the South China Sea, as Professor Levin just pointed out, China has militarized many features there. It's using its maritime militia to shove smaller countries out. And it has explicitly threatened to attack Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia if they don't start respecting China's claims, which include more than 80% of the South China Sea, and which, by the way, were ruled null and void by the World Court. That's yet another international institution that China has undermined. Um, in the East China Sea, there's always the possibility of a war between China and Japan, the hated historical enemy, and China has been sending armed Coast Guard cutters into the territorial waters around the Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands. And then I think the most important one is, is Taiwan. Uh, it's important to recognize that for the past year, China has carried out the most aggressive show of force in the Taiwan Strait in more than a generation. Chinese military patrols, many of these involve more than 30 combat aircraft, half a dozen big warships have been roaming the strait every other day. Many of them are starting to breach the median line between Taiwan and China. That's a boundary that until last year, both sides had respected for decades. And China is now regularly entering Taiwanese airspace. And several of these patrols have simulated attacks, not just on Taiwan, but on US aircraft carriers and destroyers that were sailing um, close to the Philippines. So if you just look at what China is doing, it's, it's a very scary picture. It looks to be gearing up for war against other major countries. And it's been churning out warships at a rate we haven't seen from any country since World War II. Uh, it's massively expanded its military bases um, in Fujian, which is just across the strait from Taiwan. Behind closed doors, Chinese officials have told Western analysts that calls for an invasion of Taiwan are proliferating within the CCP and that Xi Jinping is surrounded by uh, hawks who are telling him that the PLA could actually pull this off. And if you can believe Chinese state media, the Chinese public seems to be on board 
As well, according to a 2020 survey in the Global Times, 70% of the mainland population uh, supports the idea of uh, reunifying and liberating Taiwan. Um, and never forget that Xi Jinping has staked his legitimacy on recovering lost Chinese territories. In 2007, he announced that it's an inevitable requirement for realizing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And then he went on to tell U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis, we will not lose even one inch of territory left behind by our ancestors. And so, you know, there's a lot of people with access to very classified intelligence saying um, a Chinese military move is not out of the question. It's become much more likely. And conflict in any of these areas would obviously destroy whatever liberal order you think exists. You know, trade would collapse if there's a massive war in major sea lanes. Uh, if China conquers Taiwan, the only Chinese democracy is going to be snuffed out of existence. And the United States think what you will of it, it's probably not going to stand idly by in these. And so China's rise is threatening a major war between the two major um, um, uh, uh, countries in the world. And there's just no way to have a liberal order um, under that kind of threat. Thank you, Professor Beckley. Dr. Freeman? I think part of the the problem with with China and the global order is that um, the global order is based on claims of universalism, and these claims of universalism are very much rooted in Western, European, and subsequently United States um, political culture and their view of the world. And this is a view whether you take it in the relatively short term of the post-World War II era or the longer term of the last 500 years has been central to the structuring of the world um, as, we, as we have come to know it today. Um, and the problem of China is that by, in effect, its rejection of universalism, um, by its claim that it has an individual, its own path, either to economic development or to political development, however one may regard that, is an undermining of the claims to universalism of a global order. And this is the fundamental challenge. And I would agree um, that, in fact, um, the part of this um, is very much rooted in a view which in the economic terms is, is based on a rejection, not just of, in fact, the, the neoliberal um, uh, economic order, but also very much based on the rejection of what has been the fundamental concepts of uh, Western political economy for the last 200 years. And it is correct to say that, I mean, I would argue that the Chinese economic policy is very much based not on Marxism or potentially on the, the historical roots of Chinese economic th thinking, but it is based on very much on the heresy of Friedrich List and his rejection of liberal economics and um, and Smith and Ricardo in the 19th century. Of course, this was the idea which also um, was very much central to the development of the United States and Germany and other economies, um, but so subsequently became um, anathema in Western economic thinking. But it is very much central to Chinese economic thinking, and it is based on the idea of a national economy, national economic development, and national priorities. And the rejection of um, liberal economics, the rejection of, for instance, free trade, um, is very much part of what has become Chinese economic thinking, or free trade only to the to the limited extent that it is necessary for China's economic development. Um, the idea that um, China was 
presenting itself in uh, Davos as a protector of global free trade is certainly an error, uh, very much an error probably self-induced um, in Western media and amongst some other um, uh, people who wanted to believe the best that they could for for China and its, and its economic development and its capacity to save the global uh, liberal economy. But it was very much an illusion which was, had no foundation in the reality of what really is Chinese economic policy. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. I will now turn it over to Professor Lukin. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, because it's uh, a conference of denial, I mean, of, uh, den uh, uh, of, of denial of the uh, positions of uh, nobody. So my position was also given uh, mistakenly. I was called an ambassador. So I'm not an ambassador. I, I know why Anatole said it, because he wanted to put me on the equal uh, footing with himself, because he is, of course, a baron and a Svetlashi Knyasi, a prince in Russia. So, but I'm not an ambassador. My father was, uh, was an ambassador. And my son is a future ambassador, but uh, I think it's, it's too late for me to become an ambassador. Well, anyway, uh, to come back to our topic, uh, I, I, I must say that, uh, of course, it's, uh, we're discussing China now, but we should do some comparisons. And I think that's uh, the, with, of China with other countries which are supposedly not undermining the so-called liberal world order. And if we make such a comparison, we can say that China is, I mean, what's liberalism? Liberalism, uh, if we remember Kant, uh, for example, he, he was talking about li liberalism and peace. And China is, of course, a very peaceful country. It is much peaceful than the United States and many European countries because it has not been engaged in any war, in any kind of war uh, since uh, the war with Vietnam in, uh, in 1980, so for many years. Uh, during this time, the United States was in, uh, and its European allies were engaged in dozens of wars. Uh, uh, so if we are talking about economic li liberalism, uh, China is, of course, a much more liberal force uh, if we are talking about international, uh, international aspect, uh, not internal aspect. Uh, but we are talking today about uh, international order uh, because China is, of course, the, the greatest and the strongest promoter of uh, free trade and uh, the United States is not, for example, and Europe is not, uh, say, the European Union. Uh, well, if we remember Trump's time, it was uh, uh, direct, uh, he was directly against free trade. Uh, so, uh, so China, of course, is not an ideal country. It's a very, it's a problematic country. It has problems uh, in internal policy, which we are not discussing now. It's, it has a lot of problems in its foreign policy. Uh, but uh, you know, other countries, uh, if we take Britain, France, the United States, Russia, they also they also have a lot of problems in various aspects. So, what, but it is. China, which is being demonized now by the West. And the reason for it is that it is an existential pro uh, problem for the West, but it's not a problem for international, for the liberal international system. But the very existence and successes of Chinese development undermine the Western ideology of uh, so-called liberalism and liberal internationalism, because China did what other countries, including the Soviet Union, failed to do. It uh, became successful without um, accepting the Western political model. And this is not acceptable for the West at all, because this ruins all the Western ideology. And uh, that's why China is being uh, uh, demonized. What I think we should do, as I said, we should think seriously about China, how to coexist with this great country without undermining our own interests. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Lucan. I will give uh, Professor Levin just uh, two minutes uh, to make a short rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, uh, Professor Beckley really gave the game away because first he said that uh, this doesn't involve the United States, but then he said that, uh, of course, the international trade system and so on depends on military power, which means the United States. Uh, So if, in fact, uh, this system is depends on and is dominated by the United States, it's completely legitimate to ask whether the United States itself represents uh, a liberal order uh, as it can be, you know, honestly and honorably understood. And I think, you know, once again, in terms of actual American behavior, it doesn't. It is, in fact, America, which has caused far more disruption in the world um, over the past generation than China has. I should add, by the way, I've taught for seven years in the Middle East, um, in in Qatar. Not one of my students there from the Middle East or South Asia, uh, even the ones who believe in an alliance with America, not one of them believes that America represents liberalism in the world. Why should they, given their own the experience of their own countries? Uh, when it comes to China's territorial claims, once again, uh, these are rival claims. Um, the, who is right in the border dispute with India is very difficult to say, and it's completely wrong uh, just to attribute blame to the Chinese. In the South China Sea, Vietnam's claims are just as outrageous as the Chinese, and by the way, just as hostile uh, to the Philippines. The point is, the Vietnamese have much less power to do anything about it. Uh, Finally, of course, when it comes to China's military growth, uh, China has two small aircraft carriers. America, depending on how you count them, has either 11 or 21. China has 12 nuclear submarines. America has 68 before you even count the the British and the French. Uh, You can't run for any length of time a so-called liberal order on the basis of an unsustainable unilateral military hegemony of the United States run by in profoundly illiberal ways. Thank you, Professor Levin. I will now uh, give the debaters uh, an opportunity to ask each other questions, if that might be of interest. So, uh, Professor Beckley, do you have any questions uh, of the other debaters? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I just I wonder, uh, Ambassador Levin and Ambassador Lucan, uh, <laughs> are, you, are you saying you would, you would rather live if, if you could do a thought experiment and imagine a world where China was the dominant hegemon? You're saying that that would be a better world to live in than one dominated by the United States? Not at all. I, I don't want any one country to, to dominate the world. Um, I I strongly believe that it is um, both necessary and innate to the nature of the world uh, that there should be different centers uh, of power. Professor Lucan, anything you'd like to add? Well, there's a verse by uh, by Mayakovsky who said, I would love to live in Paris if there were no such place as, as Russia, as Moscow. Uh, so I would say I would like the world to be dominated by Singapore, not, not the United States and not China. Uh, Dr. Freeman, do you have any questions? Just to follow up, um, of course, Singapore is not exactly known either for its political or economic liberalism. Um, So a world dominated even by Singapore may not necessarily be conducive to your your living in in an ideal ideal world. Um, But yeah, I I just wonder um, if we define, however we define um, uh, a global liberal order, Um, even if we accept the argument that um, there are divided responsibilities for the undermining of that order, then surely we should also accept that China is um, at least in part, if not the only um, factor in the decline of the um, liberal order, 
or the, 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 the end of the illusion of an, a liberal order, that China is at least in some part responsible for that. Uh, Professor Lucan, any responses or questions? Uh, sorry. I, well, I think that by by mentioning Singapore, it was partly, of course, a joke, but it's a very effective country. So I think that the coming liberal order should be an effective liberal order that can where we can all live uh, together and cooperate. And from that point of view, uh, it would be nice if uh, it is a kind of a cooperative society, a multipolar world based on um, compromises between major, at least between major uh, centers of power. So that, that kind of world would be more effective. And I think even Singapore could play a role or, or smaller countries could play a role. Uh, Professor Lieben, anything to add? Well, I have just one question uh, to Dr. Freeman above all. Is it not true that it is above all the growth of the Chinese capitalist economy, state-led but still capitalist, that has been the principal driver of capitalist economic growth in the world as a whole over the past generation and more? Um, it, it, this being so, uh, is not China, in fact, uh, a fully uh, integrated and vital part of the vital economic underpinning of what one must call the liberal international order? Um. You have me there. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, uh, you can cut this bit out, but I well, actually, I was I um, I, I was rec I, I, I recruited myself on the basis that I would be speaking for the other side of the argument. So this makes it yeah this um your your repost a little bit difficult. Um, but <laughs> but yes. Um, uh, the fact that um, China has been um, the driver of global uh, economic growth um, is, is is certainly um, a fact. It's undeniable, um, and we know that um, uh, in large part since two thousand and eight. Um, European economic growth has been almost entirely dependent on China. Um, we know that since 2008, a large part of the United States economic growth has also been dependent on China. Um, uh, the result of this, however, has been not to create a system that is increasingly liberal, um, but in fact, it has been to provoke a reaction um, against um, the dependence which has, in, uh, has occurred um, increasingly, especially in Europe, but also in the United States, um, which has pushed um, uh, Europe and the United States into adopting increasingly illiberal policies, protectionist policies um, that um, have undermined the liberal uh, system. Great. We will now have time for questions and comments from the audience. So uh, for any audience members, uh, if you would like to uh, make a comment or question, you can simply uh, raise your hand on Zoom and I will call on you. And you are also welcome to submit a question via the chat and I will 
pose it to our debaters. Uh, Parv? Uh, hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, okay. Um, what I wanted to ask, it's an open-ended question, whoever uh, feels comfortable answering it, um, is the, the concept of accountability in a, a liberal-based uh, world order um, or a rules-based world order. Um, so... U.S.'s actions against China that supported by its allies are uh, driven by the narrative that we need to ch hold China accountable for its human rights abuses in Xinjiang or in uh, other places. However, when it comes to holding itself accountable um, for any, let's say, war crimes committed in Afghanistan or anything, um, even the thought of an investigation of its closest allies in Israel, um, the... U.S. Uh, goes as far as to threaten to sanction the International Criminal Court, either hasn't ratified the treaties or, or the, the one international body that's designed to, to hold accountability um, above national governments. Um, when uh, Secretary Blinken was asked this by Ilhan Omar um, uh, during the, the May assault on Gaza, uh, he, he specifically said, no, because, because U.S. and Israel are democracies, we believe that we have the, the mechanisms in place for victims of aggression to seek justice. Um, oftentimes we see that that doesn't happen. I mean, there was an airstrike in Afghanistan like two weeks ago and, you know, no one's batted an eye maybe, oh, we had a mistaken intelligence, uh, the aid worker was an ISIS operator or what have you. But in to, for a, a liberal uh, order, um, is is uh, accountability required or not? Um, I, I'd, I'd first like to ask uh, Professor Beckley, if you, if you don't mind, and then whoever else feels comfortable. Thank you. Spasibo. Yeah, I think absolutely there has to be accountability, and that goes for all countries, including the United States. And so cases like uh, an airstrike that kills innocent civilians, that, you know, people have to be held accountable for that. There have to be costs for that. There has to be naming and shaming involved with that. Um but the same also goes for China. And this is where I think China really does pose a major threat. Uh, you, you mentioned the Uyghurs, so we can stick with that example. I mean, putting more than a million people extrajudicially in re-education centers, uh, you know, reports of forced sterilization, and then all of the high-tech gizmos that are being essentially beta tested in that province are now being rolled out in Tibet and being exported abroad. I mean, this is this is human rights abuse on a truly epic scale. Um, and so uh, if we're talking about accountability, I agree, it has to be for all sides. And you have to also look at the magnitude, the, just the sheer number of people um, whose rights are being um, abused. Any other responses from the debaters? Other questions from the audience? Josef? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for, for not being able to record my video, but um, I'm kind of uh, in the area with the weak connection. Uh, first of all, my name is Joseph Rabina and I'm a PhD candidate at the Moscow State Institute of International Affairs. And thank you for this amazing debate concept you made today. All of your contributions were very um, fruitful and thoughtful. Uh, I would like all of you to, to perhaps outline the future of the world order. We see the growing China, or we see um, resurgent Russia, we see definitely retrenchment of the US, and uh, uh, maybe you could kind of 
um, elaborate on a on a contemporary movement in a in a in a, in a structure of international relations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Perhaps Professor Lukin. Well, yes, if I may. Um, I already mentioned that, that I think that there are only two options for the future. First, a positive one, I would say, optimistic one, is that uh, um, after uh, some some period of schooling, I would say, the West would understand that it's not alone in the world and you have to come back to some kind of uh, system based on con uh, mutual concessions, as it did during the bipolar system, for example, because there were, of course, concessions on both sides at that time. Uh, but uh, this time it would be a, a more uh, kind of uh, complicated system because we don't have only one uh, or, or only two major uh, major uh, centers of power, but more of them, at least like four or five. Uh, but they all need to uh, study how to live with each other without uh, undermining others' interests, or at least you don't you don't need to love others, but you need to. Uh, create some kind of rules like the European uh, Helsinki process uh, was before between uh, two two centers that uh, what others should not do, not to begin a war or something. But and the pessimi pessimistic uh, thing is that uh, pessimistic uh, prognosis would be that uh, our perspective would be the our prospect would be if if they don't do that. Uh, and then we'll have a very, um, a very difficult uh, period of, uh, you know, struggling of all centers uh, with others. And this would be very dangerous, especially in the world when we have uh, nuclear weapons. Thank you. Any other prognoses for what the world order will look like in the future? Uh, well, um, I mean, my fear, obviously, is that it will ca come to resemble um, the, the world during the Cold War, um, but possibly even more dangerous because with the lines less clearly drawn. Uh, but of course, the fact that China is a tremendously successful capitalist economy, and also, to repeat, does not threaten the internal order of states, it is not a revolutionary power, uh, means that I think it will be a much more complicated world than that. Um, and that you will have many states which will, in fact, try to avoid being drawn into this US-Chinese competition, um, and will, you know, be forced to try to maintain good relations with um, with both sides and and all sides, and so once again, uh, in that case, um, you will have uh, a a multipolar world in which, hopefully, as Professor Lukin has said, um, people will be able to work out rules that will maintain a working global economic order, um, which, by the way, once again, we do have. Uh, and of which China is fully par part, um, and of course, above all, that will avoid war. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, other questions from uh, the audience. Professor uh, Rocky Weitz. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to all the presenters and the organizers. This has been a very uh, thoughtful uh, set of uh, uh, debate and commentary, so thank you for that. Um, I had a question. Um, so I'm director of maritime studies here at Fletcher, um, and I wanted to take a maritime angle to this question by comparing two different bodies of water, the Arctic, as well as the South China Sea. Um, uh, China uh, semi-famously in 2018 declared itself a near Arctic nation um, and has been a fairly active observer in the Arctic Council. Uh, with, of course, Russian um, and Arctic country um, 
permission to have that observer role. Um, and in the South China Sea, we're seeing a lot of tensions as have been discussed in this conversation. Um, and as we look to that multipolar world um, and how the different centers of power, whether they're in the Indo-Pacific with uh, uh, th this new this new security alliance between Australia, the UK, um, and the US, or the Quad countries, uh, US, India, Australia, Japan, there's like a containment there that, that highlights where China has a very strong territorial claim in the South China Sea and, and a kind of reaction how is the Arctic different? Um, and I really am looking forward to having some Russian perspectives on that. Thank you. Well, yes, Anatole, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the obvious difference is that China has made absolutely no territorial claims uh, in the Arctic. Uh, it obviously wants to participate in the new sea lanes. But I think that the, by far the most important issue in the Arctic, I mean, incomparably more important than all the others, and reason why we should welcome uh, Chinese attention to that part of the world, is of course climate change. Um, not merely is, is the Arctic the place where temperatures are rising fastest, but it is obviously the area uh, of uh, by far the greatest danger of disastrous tipping points in terms of the melting of the Arctic permafrost, the release of methane, the melting of the, of the Arctic ice caps. Um, and insofar as China, of course, is uh, the largest emitter of carbon gases um, and uh, obviously a linchpin of the global economy, uh, it is essential that China be fully aware of the dangers there and be brought into cooperation to, to deal with those dangers. Of course, China is, is not doing nearly enough as yet, but then to be fair, nor is anybody else much. Uh, could I also add something to that? Uh, yes, the thing is that uh, uh, it's a very interesting question because the Chinese position on Arctic and South China Sea is actually contradictory. Uh, in South China Sea, uh, China is uh, all against uh, maritime law. Well, it says uh, it, it creates its own rules and says that it should, uh, for some historical real, uh, reasons, control all the sea, basically. But in, uh, in, uh, in Arctic, on the contrary, China is all for international law and it says it should be internationalized. And here Russia is actually tries to support its... Uh, uh, it's special rights for the Northern Sea Route, which actually it has some legal basis, but it's a, it's, it's a long story. But well, as I said, China is not an ideal country and its position is not always consistent, but we need to know it and uh, to, to talk uh, calmly about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other uh, comments before we turn to one final audience question? Okay, uh, Vladislav. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for this fruitful discussion. Uh, nowadays, it is well known fact that China is actively building a uh, so-called community of common destiny, including such initiatives as One Belt and Road Initiative and the Silk Road Initiative. And uh, in this regard, my question is, uh, what can uh, the political West uh, to do to constrain China in this field? Thank you. Uh, perhaps Professor Beckley can take this one. Sure. Yeah, I think of the things you mentioned, actually, the digital Silk Road is the really impactful one, because if China lays down the telecommunications network stretching across Eurasia, it gives it access potentially to the digital flows that go through there. Also, these things just have big setup costs. You know, once you've set up a 5G network, you're kind of locked into that technology. It's hard to just tear it up. And so countries then become more beholden to Beijing. Um, I think, uh, you know, what what can the West do to push back? What one thing that uh, people have been talking about is this idea of open RON, where you don't necessarily need to have a single competitor to something like Huawei. But what you can do is encourage more compatibility among mm. 
lots of different countries, main tech champions so that their technology all fits together. And so that you can offer an array of alternatives to other countries, especially developing countries who of course are worried about cost. And that's one of the reasons they're more attracted to uh, uh, Huawei technology. So I know one thing that's trying to be pushed through right now is this idea of this open RON uh, uh, framework where you can actually mix and match different technologies from you know, European technology, American technology, Japanese technology, et cetera, and therefore try to have a much more pluralist telecommunications um, future. Um, something like Belt and Road, I just don't know, you just can't compete uh, with the money bags that China is throwing at other countries. I also don't think, you know, if I think about it from an American strategic perspective, does it really make sense to try to build more roads or, or tunnels through Laos or Kazakhstan to compete with China? That just doesn't seem to be a smart use of, of resources. So there, I don't know if it's so much about trying to compete with China. I think you can just let China do what it wants to do with that respect. But the digital Silk Road, I mean, that's a major area of geopolitical competition. And I know one of the major initiatives is this more sort of open pluralist model where you can mix and match. Can, can I um, respond yes, a bit? Uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't disagree with that, actually. I mean, the, um, the key to competition with China, in my view, is peaceful economic competition, uh, which, yes, by all means, uh, includes providing alternatives, as many viable ones as possible, uh, to Huawei. Uh, but when it comes to building infrastructure, I agree that um, there is probably no point in competing with uh, China uh, in uh, much of Asia uh, with Belt and Road. Um, but uh, one can certainly ask why the United States has put so little real development money uh, into areas that are, in fact, American allies, and in the case of Central America, of course, are also America's neighbours. Um, uh, America has uh, uh, shamefully neglected these these areas in terms of building infrastructure and general development aid uh, for two generations now. Uh, and it's not China's fault that America has done this. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it is very wrong, I think, to scapegoat China uh, for many of the West's own failings. Uh, and there is plenty of room for the West to compete with China economically, which of course we must do, and compete in terms of international development, a good thing for everybody, uh, but without conjuring up this, uh, you know, monstrous demon uh, of a Chinese universal threat, um, which uh, in most of the world simply doesn't exist. Thank you. Um do any of the other debaters have uh, comments? Dr. Freeman? Well, um, the, the problem with the Belt and Road is that um, it has been an ex overextension of, of Chinese power. Um, uh, the, the, it was very much the initiative which came from the top from Xi Jinping um, and it has been very much an overestimation by Xi Jinping himself and those around him of the capacity of China to create a model and to export a model of building infrastructure, not necessarily building economic development, but building if infrastructure. It has got into enormous difficulties in a number of countries. There have been some uh, successes. Um, but um, what we have seen, in fact, is that um, uh, if you look at investment or outward investment from China and indeed investment in Belt and Road projects, that this has actually been declining for a number of years. Um, however, um, the creation of the Belt and Road has brought into a very clear highlight, as has been already said, um, the failure of uh, the Western order, um, the weakness of the Western order, of um, including the 
international institutions like the World Bank to um, provide the infrastructure, provide the, the development um, that the rest of the world has 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 required. Um, whether or not the United States, which has its initiatives, which has been being promoted now by Biden, or the European Union, which has had its initiatives also um, to counter the Belt and Road, can actually achieve this and achieve this effectively, I would very much doubt. Um, uh, the, the models which um, uh, the European Union and the United States are promoting and even the capacities of the European Union and the United States to compete against China in the area of, um, of, of infrastructure are, uh, I would argue, extremely weak. Well, thank you for your answers. Thank you so much to the audience for your questions and comments. Uh, I will now uh, allow the participants to make a final uh, set of remarks, uh, no more than a couple of minutes, and uh, then we will uh, have uh, the audience vote again. So, uh, Professor Beckley. Okay. Uh, well, I guess thank you so much for this great debate and for the discussion. Um, I, I would just, the last thing I want to say is just to refocus what the whole point of this debate was. The resolution does not say who threatens the liberal order more, America or China. Uh, this We're focused on China here. And you can, you can hate America and still vote for this resolution. And if you're on the fence, I would urge you to please look at China as it is, not as some utopian world where China becomes a giant Singapore, because that's frankly not the China that we are confronting today. Um, I mean, frankly, some of the things that my esteemed competitors have said just strike me as completely at odds with reality. So when Professor Levin talks about China as this uh, wonderful capitalist paradise, I mean, I wonder if he's read a newspaper in the last three months, the tech regulations alone that China has just put down have essentially crushed a lot of those empires and erased more than a trillion dollars in market capitalization from the largest tech firms in China. Now, under new regulations, every company with more than 50 employees has to have a CCP commissar on staff to make sure that they're doing whatever Xi Jinping wants them to be doing. Capitalist, 80% of the loans in China and, and subsidies from Chinese banks go to state-owned enterprises or state-connected firms while private firms are being starved of capital. And internationally, China has been fighting trade wars, not just with the United States, but with a ton of countries for a variety of reasons that shouldn't enter into a free market system, like Australia calling for an investigation into COVID, and suddenly that results in a massive trade war with Beijing. Th these are not the actions of a free market uh, capitalist committed uh, economy. Uh, militarily, uh, 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 Ambassador Lucan said China is this peaceful country. Th tell that to the Indians. Tell that to the families of the Indians who were beaten to death by Chinese soldiers. Tell that to the, to the Taiwanese. Tell that to any country around the South China Sea that has to deal with China's bullying on a daily basis. Uh, politically, Mao, uh, Xi Jinping has, has, has basically slid China back to a sort of Maoist cult of personality. He has literally appointed himself dictator for life. He's purged all of his political rivals, more than 1.5 million senior CCP officials, including military generals, have been purged. Some of them just disappeared or killed. Meanwhile, imprisoning more than a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. The, I mean, the idea that this somehow can just pass and is not going to be threatened, any kind of ideal of a liberal order, strikes me as laughable. And the last thing I would point out, because Professor Levin mentioned the students that he took a straw poll of in Qatar, saying they like China and don't like the United States. I didn't or, say that. I did not say that. You, you I, they just, said nothing about liking China. Okay, they so just they said that like, the United, they States, States, the United not... States. Okay, they dislike the United States. Well, according to the Pew Research Institute, uh, anti-China sentiment around the world is at its highest level since the Tiananmen Square massacre. And this is also according to inter leaked internal Chinese documents. The Chinese Communist Party, their own intelligence services have come to the exact same conclusion that in the wake of COVID and everything else, that people are turning against China. I would also point to other polls that were conducted during the Donald Trump administration where the United States admittedly was going around and treating its allies terribly. 
and was basically pursuing a rogue superpower kind of foreign policy. And yet, even under those terrible conditions, most people in most countries still preferred a world that would be dominated by the United States than by China. So the bottom line is you have to wonder why. You have to, if, if the United States is so bad, why do so many people and increasing numbers of people feel that China is this major threat? And it probably has something to do with the many examples that I've given uh, in, in speeches. So thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Beckley. Dr. Freeman, and I, and I would ask uh, the participants, please try to stay within the time limits so we can conclude on time. So, yes, um, we are talking here about the global liberal order, however we choose to, to, to believe it exists, whether it's simply a matter of um, a rather crude um, power relationship or whether it is something that is more sophisticated and is actually a rules-based liberal political and economic order. Um, and it is simply a fact that however you want to believe that this global liberal order is constituted, the rise of China, a very simple term, uh, threatens that order, whether it is simply a matter of the balance of power or whether it is a more complex matter of the relationship between power and rules, norms, um, and more sophisticated aspects of a global order. Um, so China, by its very rise, by the fact that it doesn't fully accept the precepts which have come to um, constitute this liberal order since particularly the fall of the Soviet Union um, and the end of the Cold War means that China um, threatens and undermines the, the existence of that global order. In terms of the regional distribution of power, um, Asia, East Asia in particular, has always been at the limit of Western uh, military, political military, and economic power. The rise of China um, in conjunction with the rise of the rest of East Asia um, means that this power of the West to constitute itself as the global liberal order now cannot be sustained. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Uh, Professor Lucan. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think that our audience has a very difficult choice to answer yes or no uh, to a question to give an, uh, such a, an answer yes or no to a question which has no yes or no answer and frankly uh, d despite the fact that i'm on the no uh, side uh, uh, i for the first time uh, during the first voting i voted undecided because um, it, it is it's still not very clear to me what i should say uh, how I should vote, but I I would th I, I think that it's preferable. Well, I would advise you to vote no, just to show that this question is often used as a tool of demonizing China. Well, I've been studying China for all my life. That's a very long time. And when I first came to China early 1980s, it was a very poor country and very ineffective. And when you go to China now, you, you would see that it's a very effective country and uh, quite rich, I would say, compared to many other countries in the world. And, uh, the, uh, and it's a very successful country because, uh, you know, just to feed such a huge population is a you know, very big thing that it did for the world. And we should thank its leadership for that. Uh, but after saying that, of course, I understand that its uh, regime is pretty pretty weird or brutal, and uh, its foreign policy is not always successful. But what we should 
do is to study or see this country without ideological, not, not through ideological lens, as, my, uh, as some of my colleagues do, uh, but uh, talk about it realistically. So if you vote no, I would say that you, uh, that you, give, that you are giving them this kind of advice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lukin. And uh, last but not least, uh, Professor Lieben. I, I must simply agree with that. Please vote no, uh, you know, no to the demonization of China uh, and the creation of a monstrous threat, which doesn't in fact exist. Uh, because actually what the opinion polls uh, over the past 10 years show uh, is that a majority of the people around the world don't want to be dominated by China or the USA. They want to be left alone to grow as they can in prosperity uh, in an, an open world. Um, let's hope that they are given the chance. Uh, as um, you know, uh, Professor Beckley referred to the, the fight in the Himalayas, look, this, this was a fight between the Indians and the Chinese. This was not a massacre of the Indians by the Chinese. And uh, have we suddenly decided that everybody who is against China is automatically right? Uh, do we uh, think uh, that within India or more widely, the kind of Hindu fascism represented by the government of India and Narendra Modi is not a threat to the liberal order? Uh, believe me, uh, there are a great many liberal Indians who would disagree with that one. Uh, and yet India is now being built up as a key element by the United States of this so-called liberal order. Uh, when it comes to the Chinese capitalist order at home, um, Professor Beckley re referred to the uh, crackdown on um, high-tech high firms uh, in China. Look, this is now a very extensive debate in the West with many people, and not only on the left, saying that the power of men like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, has grown far too great and far too monopolistic, and that this is a tremendous threat to liberal democracy in the West. Well, uh, I hope that the methods eventually adopted to curb these people will not be those of the Chinese government, but we better find something to curb these people. Um, and to do that is not a threat to liberal democracy. It is in support of liberal democracy. Uh, so um, competition is inherent to the capitalist world order and to any liberal order. Uh, let us try to make sure that that competition is conducted along peaceful lines. Thank you, Professor Lieben. Uh, it is now time for us to vote once again uh, on a complex question with two simple answers. And some of you may still be undecided, and that's OK. Uh, but I will go ahead and show uh, the poll once again. Does the rise of China threaten the liberal international order? Please vote now. Okay, uh, it looks like 22 people have voted. I will go ahead and end the poll. And so the results are as follows, 41% yes, 55% no, and 5%, <laughs> one person is still undecided. That means that uh, the no team was able to convince at least part of the audience. Uh, so congratulations to team uh, no, but it does show that uh, there, uh, there are still some on the yes side. Um, thank you so much to all of the participants for a lively and thoughtful debate, uh, for an insightful discussion. And uh, thank you very much to my colleagues, Natalia and uh, Yvonne, for helping us organize this debate and all of the organizers who uh, took part in planning this event. Uh, we have two more debates in the next two weeks, and we hope you will join us for those. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, goodbye to, to everyone, and thank you so much again for participating.
Thank you. Thanks to everyone. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Recording Thank you. stopped. Thank you. Yeah.